I grew up in a house where like God was not a word we used a lot. Um, I would listen in class and I would hear these stories of all these crazy things that happened. You, know, he, you hear Noah built an ark and brought all these animals and you hear that you know, Jesus died on a cross and then came back. And I was like, okay, all right, it's a great story. I, I appreciate a good story, but I didn't believe it. I came back from college like a couple years later and um, I was feeling kind of lost. I was just like, I don't know where my place is and thinking, where do I fit in, you know? I sat down one day and I was like, you know what, what's the common denominator in all of the people in my life that are happy? And I realized they all went to church and I didn't think anything like, oh, you know, that's definitely what it is. I thought, you know, no, that's not it, just being crazy. And then one day my cousin, who I'm super close to, was like, you know, why don't you come to church with us on Sunday? And so I went, and that weekend, the pastor just, I swear, he was talking straight at me. He made me laugh so hard that I almost fell out of my chair. I remember leaving and feeling a sense of peace. And I was like, you know what, this isn't bad. Like, I don't mind coming. My cousin's husband at the time had gone through Rooted. I saw this incredible change in him, and I was like, who are you? What happened to you? And he's like, Rooted, man. I got, I, I'm telling you, it's Rooted. You got to do it. And I was like, there's no way I'm gonna go to a class on God, no. There's, I barely come to church. It's like, okay, you know, I'm gonna try it. I'll just, I'll go one week, see how it goes. We went around the room that night and we just kind of talked a little bit and I was like, you know what, that wasn't so bad. I'm gonna go back next week, all right, I'll go. I started to feel really connected to the people and I think the moment when I was like, these are my people. One of the weeks you talk about just what you're having trouble with in your life and I just started sobbing and there's one person patting me and one person has my hand and everyone's just looking at me with this look of love and I'm thinking there are 15 people sitting here and they do nothing but love me and it's unconditional and I don't understand why. And I remember thinking, I, I really, I love this group of people. And there was this moment, I looked down at my book and I was like, I believe this. This isn't just a story anymore. No, I, I believe this. I'm not just saying this because I want to. I genuinely believe it. So whereas before I was feeling alone and like I really didn't have a purpose or a place, through God I have this community of people who love and care about me. I have the strength just from Him and through everyone around me and it's, it's really, it's a great feeling. It's not true. Now Laura's going to take it. Don't perfect. try to but we gotta save, save America. from Peña. I am the campus pastor here. It is truly an honor to have you this morning with us. I pray that uh, we be civil today. Uh, we be civil as we are about to kick off this incredible brand new series, uh, Political Powder Keg. And I was, I was even about to wear a suit and tie just to, to make it a little more official. And I was like, no way. No way. I can't even remember the last time I wore a suit and tie. I don't think my suit fits me, put it that way. Anyway, this series is a, is a series that is designed to make all of us a little uncomfortable, a little uncomfortable, and hopefully in the process make, us, uh, all, make all of us just a little bit better. Um, you see, there are famously two things that civilized folks shouldn't talk about, religion and politics. Religion and politics, and since we talk about religion pretty regularly around here, uh, we thought it might be time to talk a little bit about that other thing as well. Um, before, before we jump into this series, uh, let's, let, this, this series is not about dividing sides, politics. This is really about understanding a few things, and I want to share with you that this morning. So no gloves, no gloves today, all right? But in all seriousness, it's becoming more and more difficult to untangle 
untangle these two topics from each other. It seems like politicians are increasingly using religious language to justify their stance, and pastors are, are drawing these clear political lines that they expect people to get behind. It's worth noting that while the word politics has become synonymous with partyism, politicians, and endless political cycles, that's not remotely close to its original meaning. The word politics comes from the Greek word polis, meaning city, and politis, right, meaning citizen. So city and citizen. And so in essence, politics is simply how we, the city, the citizens, live together how we organize our communities, and what we agree to do with our shared resources, from building a school to raising an army. But politics, politics have devolved into a zero-sum political battle between two enemies, the red and the blue, the elephant and the donkey. The Democratic Party and the Republican Party. But before I move on, how many of you just do not care a lot about politics? Just raise your hand. The others of you, I I can see, you, you have an opinion. But listen to what I want to share with you today. A recent CBS YouGov poll uncovered that 54% of Americans view other Americans as their biggest threat to their way of life. 50, that's over 50% of people view other Americans as a threat to their way of life. In Tribe Combat Journalist Sebastian Junger writes, people speak, quote, people speak with incredible contempt about, depend, uh, about, depending on their views, the rich, the poor, the educated, the foreign-born, the president, the entire U.S. government. It's a level of contempt that is usually reserved for enemies in wartime, except that now it's applied to our fellow citizens. Wow. In 2022, Pew Research report founded that a majority in both parties view members of the other party as more immoral, dishonest, lazy, unintelligent, and closed-minded than other Americans. According to a recent Pew Research poll, 40% of Democrats and 43% of Republicans belong to their party because they oppose the other party's values and not because they stand for what their party represents. found that one interesting. And lastly, political scientists refer to this level of polarization as negative partisanship, in which super factions hang together mainly out of sheer hatred of their other team, rather than a shared sense of Those statistics are incredible to me. I don't even like politics. But when you do the research, you start to unveil these things, and it's like, really? But because of the constant mudslinging and cutthroat culture that our political parties have embraced, it has become messy, dangerous, and often painful to talk about politics. That's why politics doesn't get talked much about in the church. Excuse me. <clears throat> but this series, this series isn't about how you vote, but about how you relate. Let me share it in a different way. 
You see, we are less interested in your politics than we are in how you talk about politics. We are less interested in your politics than we are in how you interact with people. We're less interested in your political affiliations than we are in your interpersonal relationships. Because as we'll see, that's what Jesus cared about the most. I want to remind you that being a Christian is someone who wants to follow and emulate the life of Jesus. Not the life of a politician. But I'm not going to stir things up just yet. In our current cultural climate, it seems like there are no neutral topics or neutral people. And even when a person says that they, they don't want to be political, we quickly make political assumptions based on that statement itself. So stop judging me. These days, everything and everybody is uh, politicized and put neatly into one or two buckets, the red one or the blue one. Even biblical topics have been adopted by political parties. Things like sexuality, well, the Republicans have taken a stance on that. Immigration, well, the Democrats have taken that. The unborn Republicans have taken that. Racism, the Democrats have fought on that. The poor and the needy, Democrats, right? So it leaves us this question, right? Like, which side is God on? Which side is God on? Is he on yours? Is he on mine? Right? Is he on theirs? Both? Neither? But God, but God's on my side, right? That's my title for today. But God is on my side, right? Because that's what we, we he has to be. If I'm a follower of God, he has to be on my side. <clears throat> Excuse me. Listen, church, we all, we all want the power on our side, right? We all want the power on our side. In my house, it is full of women. I am outnumbered five to one, right? And I'm always trying to get someone to jump on my side. Never works. There's topics of conversation I do not want to get into. And there are others that I have to get into. And then when I want to talk about some, nobody wants to talk about those. But whenever one of them does something that my wife does not like, they quickly call out, but dad said. All of a sudden, <laughs> dad's on their side. Kids are good at this, right? They are, they are good at using the name of a parent to justify their actions. Andy Stanley said it this way, quote, for far too long, far too many of us have despised the master by editing and reimagining him so as to recruit him to our political party of choice. But follow Jesus through the Gospels and you'll discover that he cannot be recruited and he does not take sides. Dr. Tony Evans said it this way, Jesus didn't come to take sides, he came to take over. Now there's a fascinating story in the Old Testament that shares this point and I want to quickly kind of share it with you. It won't be on the screen, but I'm going to try to quickly because there's a lot of, I got to squeeze in here. So, uh, uh, but I want you to get it, right? And it's 1 Samuel 4, 1 Samuel 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. At this time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. The Philistines attacked and defeated the army of Israel, killing 4,000 men. 
After the battle was over, the elders of Israel asked, why, why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? Let's bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. We can carry it into battle with us. It will save us from our enemies. So they sent for the ark of the covenant. And when the Israelites saw the ark of the covenant coming into the camp, they began to shout. They began to scream so loud. So, so loud that it made the earth, the ground shake. They were truly believing what was happening. The Philistines are confused. They're confused. They're on the other side and they're confused. And they start asking, man, what is going on? What's all the shouting about about at the Hebrew camp? And when they're told it's because of the Ark of the Covenant that had arrived, They panicked. Oh, they panicked. The Ark of the Covenant is coming. It has arrived to help the Israelites. The gods have come into their camp, they cried. Oh, my gosh, this is a disaster. We have never had to face anything like this before. Help! Who can save us from this mighty, from these mighty gods of Israel? They are the same gods who destroyed the Egyptians with plagues. So they remember. Fight for your life because if you don't, we will become Hebrew slaves. Done. It's done. Verse 10. So the Philistines, the Philistines fought desperately and Israel was defeated again. It was a massive slaughter. 30,000 Israelite soldiers died on that day. The survivors fled to their tents, and the ark was captured. What happened? What happened here? The story goes against so many of our assumptions about who God is, how he works, and especially whose side he's on. These are the Israelites, God's chosen people. They're bringing in the Ark of the Covenant. It is a guaranteed victory. Hello. That's not how it played out. You see, many of us believe the same thing. Right? We believe that if we love God and care about things that he cares about, then he's got to be on our side, right? He's got to be on our side. Here's a takeaway from this particular part of Scripture and our message today. Israel, Israel took God's name and, and, and symbol into battle assuming that it would give them the victory over the clearly evil Philistines. But they did not take God into the battle. Listen, God will not, will not be drafted in for our own purposes. He will not. And in case you think this is a fluke, let's Let's reference another story earlier in Scripture where Joshua is leading Israel to the promised land. Joshua 5, verses 13 and 14, it says, When Joshua was near the town of Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a sword in hand. Joshua went to him and demanded, Are you friend or are you foe? Neither one, he replied. I am the commander of the Lord's army at this time. Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence. I am at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? Once again, it should seem really obvious that God would be on Joshua's side. After all, he's trying to get God's children to the promised land because that's what God told him to do. He's following instructions. 
God told them, hey, this is my people. Take them here. Take them to the promised land. It's not even Joshua's idea. It's God's. So what's up with that? And here's the takeaway from this story. Even, I want you to hear me clearly, even when we're pursuing things God has called us to pursue, it's not that God is on our side, but more so that we're aligning ourselves with God. That we're aligning ourselves with God as we come to learn and apply the words and the ways of Jesus, we can expect to find more of the same. I'm often caught off guard by his refusal to pick sides in almost everything. I can't tell you how many times I prayed for the Yankees to win certain things. I'm sure you've prayed for your Dodgers too, and it didn't work out as well. I think about the things that you have prayed for and God had not take sides. I remember as a kid praying, you know, I want to win this game. I want to win this game. I was, Lord, help me win this game. And I was reminded later on in life, God's not interested on the victory or the losing. He's interested in how you represent him. One of the clearest examples is when the religious leaders and political leaders tried to trap Jesus in a political debate about taxes. You remember that story? It's found in Matthew 22, 16 to 21. It says, they sent some of their disciples along with the supporters of Herod to meet with him. Teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You teach the way of God truthfully. You are impartial and don't play favorites. Now tell us what you think about this. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus knew their evil motives. You hypocrites, he said. Why are you trying to trap me? Here, show me the coin used for the tax. When they handed him a Roman coin, he asked, whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well then, he said, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Here's the thing, church. Historians agree that people were cruelly and and unfairly taxed during Jesus' time. It was the perfect, the perfect opportunity for Jesus to relieve the suffering of the Judeans by speaking out against the political wrongdoing. But rather rather than take sides on political issues that clearly was doing harm, we're reminded by this part of Scripture that Jesus didn't come to fix earthly kingdoms, but to set up his own. He didn't come to fix the kingdom of others. He came to establish his own. And can I remind you that the kingdom of Rome has fallen and Herod is is all but a footnote in the story of Jesus and his kingdom. Friends, Jesus came to rule in our hearts and reign over our behavior. I want you to sit on that for a little bit. Jesus came to rule in our hearts. In other words, he came to take over our hearts, to be the king of our hearts, and to reign over what we do, how we act, how we say things, how we do things. When Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God, he wasn't saying that the tax was fair. He was putting everyone on notice that God is pursuing something much bigger, much bigger than a temporary win in a temporary kingdom. Every king has a domain, right? Kingdom. <clears throat> their, their domain is where 
their will is enacted and followed above or any other person or ruler. A king's domain could be people, could be lands, or a combination of both. Now, Jesus, Jesus was not, I want you to grab onto this this morning, Jesus was not and is not a religious figure. He is king. He is king. I want you to sit on that because some of us have, have kind of reconstructed or tried to move the furniture in his kingdom. You ever try to move the furniture in someone else's house without letting them know? He is king. And Matthew 6, 24 reminds us that no one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve two masters. There is one king and one king alone. As Christians, we're called to follow and obey this king above all. We're called to follow Jesus above all. But many of us in the church view Jesus as just the forgiver of our sins, the blesser of our wants and our desires rather than the king of our lives. Friends, this dangerously opens the door to lesser kings and kingdoms to rule over our lives. The minute you do not let Jesus sit on the throne of your life, what you're saying and what you are doing is allowing someone else to sit on that throne. To have dominion over your life. To have dominion over your decisions. The minute you put our, our influencer in the place of Jesus' seat, he is no longer your king. That influencer is. The minute you put a politician in the place of Jesus' seat is the minute that Jesus is no longer king of your life and some old white dude is. No offense, sorry. Friends, thrones never remain empty for long. When we are more comfortable around people with the same political leaning than we are with people who have the same faith, we may have the wrong king on the throne. In other words, when we have disputes with other people about the politics and not align our hearts about the faith, when we are more concerned about our children's, friends, families, political ideology or ideology than we are about their faith. When we're more concerned about what they think Fox is trying to say and CNN than we are about their faith, we may have the wrong king on the throne. Now, before you go on and shrug your shoulders and say, man, Pastor, that's, that's a little bit dramatic of you. Listen to this. A recent Stanford University study found that many Americans now consider their, their political identity as more important, more important to them than their race, religion, and ethnicity. At church, and I think that if we're honest, we may discover that our politics are fighting for lordship in our lives. Our politics are fighting for lordship in our lives, dangerously close to being one God under nation. I thought it was one nation under God. But the way things are moving and the way things, the way people are pushing things, it almost feels like it's one God of the nation. So let me remind you 
in case you forgot about our king. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things that we see and the things that we cannot see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased, pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. He is king. I want to wrap this up this morning. There's good news, church. There's, there's good news. And the good news, the gospel of Jesus, is that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him will be saved. And the calling of Jesus' followers is not only to believe, but also to live, to speak, to act, and to move in a way that reflects the prayer that we all know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what God is calling us to do. When we acknowledge him as the king over our lives, what we're saying is, Lord, we're going to take your will and we're going to do everything that we can to live that out here. We want to best represent you. And the only way that we can best represent you is by the way we act, by the way we speak, by the way we think. And make sure that those three things align up with your word, with your heart. Too many of us put up the gloves on when it comes to the politics. And I ask you, where was that written in Scripture? When did Jesus put on the gloves and start, start knocking people out? Friends, are you willing to prioritize your faith over your politics? Are you willing to prioritize your faith over your politics? As a kid, I didn't understand politics. And, and every time they showed the house on TV, and I would always wonder, like, why does... These people all have red ties and all these people have blue ties. And someone said, oh, they're on opposite team. And I was like, and they represent us? Wow. Who do you represent, church? Who do you represent? Because the question we're probably all asking, does, does, is God on my side? And I want to ask you, are you on God's side? Are you on his side? Are you willing to prioritize the kingdom of God over any other kingdom? So here's your homework for today, this week. Consider this week, is Jesus just the forgiver of your sins or, he, or is he king of your life? 
Is he the forgiver of your sins? Is he, is he just the, the, the giver of your wants and your desires? Or is he the king of your life? Are you trying to bring him glory and honor by the way you speak, by the way you act, by the way you think, by the way you treat other people? Don't get me wrong, church. Salvation is, is a beautiful thing. It really is. When someone gives their heart to Jesus, have surrendered their life into the hands of Jesus, it's a beautiful and incredible, powerful thing. And we'll, we'll celebrate that all, all day long. But the truth is that Jesus didn't just come to get you a ticket into heaven. That was part of the plan. We're so grateful for that part of the plan. He also came to show you how to experience true life now, here on earth. Yes, this is all but temporary. Our final destination is to come. But he's given us life here, now. And we can't experience the John 10, 10 life unless we follow the king, the one true king. We can't get that rich and satisfying life that he came to bring us if we're allowing ourselves to be drafted into the red party or the blue party. We're throwing rocks and stones at people because of the color, because of the donkey or the elephant. Who chose this? Anyway, you are loved, church. You are loved not just by me, but you are loved by the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he wants nothing more than to rule over your life to give you that good, satisfying, rich life. But he can only do that when you take off those phonies off the throne and allow him to be seated in his rightful place. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we, we bless you. And we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that you are here and your spirit is dwelling in this place and that you saw fit that we would begin this series. Political power keg, powder keg. That we would begin to talk about things that probably other churches or Institutions are not willing to talk about because there's so much discourse in the crowd. But Lord, that this message is not whether you lean to the left or you lean to the right, whether you like blue or red, prefer the elephant or the donkey. But at the very core of our lives, Lord, at the very core of our hearts, This is all and will always be about you. You are the king. You are seated on the throne. We sing praises and adoration unto you. You reign in our hearts. Our choices in life, the way we think, we act, say, the things that we say, they flow from you. And if somehow, Lord, today we are here and we've kind of, kind of stepped aside and allowed someone else to sit on that throne, may we have the boldness and the courage 
to kick them off, kick them out, kick them to the curb and say, Jesus, you belong here. God, you are the ruler of my life. And let my choices, let my actions, let my thoughts and my words represent you on a daily basis. Because it is you who sent your son pay the price for us. It is you who first loved us. It is you who created us from dust. Let our hearts reflect your heart. And may you always get the glory and the honor. May these next few weeks help us understand just a little bit more of what you desire from us as believers. Not that we shouldn't be involved in politics or not be involved, but that we would always put you at the forefront of every decision South Hills Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that He's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts and talents and abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to, to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because a Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give, and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, or whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that He can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.